My viewers and subscribers and followers have been asking me for some time to do more of these personal development videos where I talk about my own philosophical, um, if you want to call it progress, <laughs> you know, my formation, who it is that I, I really got captivated by and, and studied and who, who's still valuable for me in the present. Um, so one of the ones that was quite important for me in my graduate career was Jacques Derrida. I was, I was uh, very interested in his work and uh, read my way through his, his corpus and, um, you know, in a fairly small department, I think we had about 15 uh, professors in our, our graduate department and something like, you know, 30 to 40 graduate students. Uh, for a while, I was the Derrida guy. <laughs> Um, and I, I ended up leaving that behind, so I'm doing this video to talk about um, that, that phase of my, my philosophical development. So like I said, I, I got into him in graduate school, and that's in part because um, Derrida wasn't somebody who you would get exposed to where I went to undergrad or in the you know, less formal philosophical studies that I had been carrying out since my, my teen years, where I would, you know, buy books and uh, read my way through them and try to make some sense out of this, this discipline called philosophy because I was interested in how it would fit in with understanding the world and myself and my life and those sorts of things. So it wasn't until I got to Southern Illinois University in uh, 2005 that um, I really heard much about Derrida. I, you know, um, I had a whole stack of continental philosophy books given to me, and there's a whole another story to tell about that when I was an undergrad uh, as part of a, a, a the perk of a reading project that I was doing, helping to present another student's work. But um, Derrida was not one of the thinkers in there, surprisingly. And so, you know, why did I get into Derrida? Um, I suppose that you could say that that part of it was because I came to Southern Illinois University really interested in the philosophy of language. And when I first got there, I signed up for classes in, in you know, continental philosophy, but also a lot of classes in analytic philosophy in part because I knew that analytic philosophy is interested in language. I knew that language is a major theme in continental philosophy. Um, I was coming in as somebody who was already, you know, really into Nietzsche. You can, you know, watch the video about my Nietzschean phase. I'll put a link to it in the video description here below. Um, and so I was trying to, you know, um, think as much as possible about things in, in you could say, in linguistic terms. And um, what I ended up doing, and I'll come back to this in a bit, but what I ended up doing quite often was engaging in lines of thinking or criticism or argument in the course of my seminars or in my conversations with other older you know, um, graduate students who'd progressed further and had read much more than I had. I would um, say things that were fairly Derridian without having read Derrida. And so, you know, what did that, um, you know, what did that point towards? Well, these, these people said, oh, you, you know, are you getting this from Derrida? You'd probably really like Derrida. Uh, you should read him sometime. And so I thought, well, okay, yeah, sure. Um, I should also mention that I was uh, going through my, my Francophile phase as well. Um, you know, my, my family, I, I'm, an, a, I'm adopted, and, and my mother's side of the family is French-Canadian. They've been here in the States for a number of generations, but my mother grew up um, speaking French before English, and so I learned French. Um, and, uh, you know, it was the 90s, so there was kind of, a, you know, French-Canadian nationalism going on. It was the year of the referendum was 95. Um, you know, the area that we, we live in here in the Midwest at one time was part of New France. And so there was all of that. I'm going to study French people to stick it to the Anglos as well. And Derrida was all about sticking it to the Anglos at one point or another. So all, all of that was going on. But I was, um, you know, in my first, I would say, my first uh, year and a half, I was primarily focused on, you know, um, my coursework. And the reading that I was doing outside of that 
was, um, you know, it was other French authors like Louis Ferdinand Saline, you know. Um, I was, you know, reading and rereading Voyage au bout de la nuit and uh, Jacques Bataille and people like, like that. Um, and, uh, you know, I was also progressing in, in my, my studies in German. Um, I was uh, doing a lot of work on Wittgenstein for, for a while. As a matter of fact, I, I started out writing my master's thesis on, on him. And because um, where I wanted to steer him was, was, you know, in retrospect, more along Derridian lines, um, I didn't end up completing that. And you can, you can hear about that in my, my Wittgensteinian phase video as well. I also got into Adorno. Uh, Adorno I really enjoyed because uh, in order to adequately read his books in, in the German, you needed five languages, uh, you know, most of which I had either under my belt or I could, you know, start to get around with. The Greek took, took a while to come later on. But um, so there was all of that going on. And, you know, I was still super into Nietzsche, getting into arguments about Nietzsche and about politics and language and society. And um, at the same time, a friend of mine also proposed that we should do a reading group on Ferdinand de Saussure's uh, course in general linguistics. I read the French, of course. He had the English version, uh, the translation of which I don't remember. You know which edition it was at the time was actually quite quite bad, and you know we'd compare notes back and forth. So all this stuff is kind of fermenting in there, and then um, I start reading Derrida, and I was really you know quite captivated with that. Before I I um, ended up reading some of his stuff, though I managed to effectively replicate his work, although not at the, the level that, that he had, um, in my master's thesis, which was on Husserl. Um, and I focused on Hus the, the Husserl's passive synthesis lectures, which was being translated by one of the professors at the time. I, I was very interested, again, in language. So I was focusing on how language uh, develops, and I was sort of blending together Husserl and de Saussure, not realizing that Derrida had already done it and done it much better in Speech and Phenomena, <laughs> which was his own very early work as well, right? Um, but so all of this is going on, and then finally I start getting into Derrida and reading some of his, his essays, and I was uh, really captivated. Um, and, and why was I particularly captivated? Well, I think that looking back on it, and it's been some time since I've actually given this much thought, um, there are some things that I think Derrida is right about, um, and I still think so today. Uh, you know, much of these are things that you can also find in other authors, uh, and Derrida sometimes takes them a bit too far. Uh, which, which then, you know, doesn't nullify the original rightness, but, but it somewhat attenuates it. But I was really captivated by, you know, pointing out that things like, um, you know, his, his famous dictum, there's nothing outside of the text. If you understand that in terms not of, well, there's nothing outside of, a, you know, written language or a book or something like that, but you understand it as, as there's nothing that escapes the, the codes, the, the ways in which language, you know, if you want to put it in terms of in facts or, or conditions or any of these things, our, our world, I think he's actually fundamentally right about that. You know, I know there's mystics who want to say, oh, there's stuff totally beyond language. Well, you, you're talking about it, right? <laughs> the ineffable um, is within language insofar as we're, we're signaling something about it. We don't have to go into all sorts of things about that. But there was, there was a part of me that was really captivated by that. And, and that's the part of a person that, that's very interested in, you know, deep questions that sometimes lead you into epistemology, sometimes lead you into metaphysics, sometimes lead you into moral philosophy. In Derrida, these were all connected up with each other, as, as they often are for, for French writers. It's not for uh, nothing that one of the flagship journals in 20th century French philosophy was the Revue de Métaphysique et Morale, right? The Review of Metaphysics and Moral Theory, you could call it, right? Or, or however you want to translate it because these things do interpenetrate each other. And, you know, I was fortunate 
in that when I went to SIU, um, it was a pluralistic department. We still had some of the analytics who, you know, wanted to banish everybody else out of philosophy, but they were the old guard and they were kind of dying out. Um, they had, they had, you know, uh, done what they were going to do, you know, decades before. There, there, was, there were some younger analytics who were a bit more, um, you know, uh, they, they were good scholars in their own right, but they were also understanding of the fact that analytic philosophy, particularly of the logical positivism type, was not the be-all and end-all. Um, we had classical American philosophy. We had some people who did some history of philosophies, particularly early modern philosophy. Uh, we had a guy, Andrew Black, who was great with that, who was an analytically trained person, but who would let me do more continental historical approaches to, to the thinkers that, that I, we were studying. And then we had you know, a strong cadre of people doing continental philosophy. We had Garth Gillen, who became my mentor, who did uh, contemporary French philosophy and Adorno. Uh, we had Stephen Tymon, who did, you know, German philosophy, but also Kierkegaard. Um, Anthony Steinbach, who had who'd recently come in, who was doing uh, a lot of phenomenological work. Uh, then we hired uh, Ken Stickers as well, who was, you know, sort of split between American and, uh, and uh, Continental, but he did work on Shaler and uh, on people like that. So it was, it was really quite a good place to be for getting um, a, you know, a lot of, of background stuff. But what was even better, graduate students tend to um, be sort of you know, fan types, right? They, they get into Husserl and now the whole world has to be read through Husserl and they, they apply Husserl to everything. Or they get into Aristotle and the Aristotle person you know, has, to, has to be the champion of Aristotle. And, and so the same thing happened with me in terms of, you know, um, thinking in terms of language and, and not just Derrida, but primarily Derrida, um, you know, you, you, you test out whether what you're doing makes sense by throwing it into the mix and, and sort of contending with other people. And Derrida, I think, particularly lent himself to that because his work is intrinsically agonistic. Um, in a way that you, you can say that other philosophers aren't necessarily um, doing. And so, you know, I, I was really getting into to studying Derrida, and I had to, you know, do it against, you, you could say, in a somewhat hostile environment. And, and I thrived at that time on that sort of, you know, back and forth and, and fighting. And then, you know, uh, when I went, when my mom actually went on vacation to France, she brought back several books for me, and um, one of them was, you know, the Grammatologie, right? And uh, I hadn't read it at, at that point. You know, I just read some some essays, and people were, you know, telling me, "Oh, this is the kind of thing that you seem to be into." And then I spent about a month, you know, in my office. I remember doing that, going through this and being like, "Wow, yeah, this is this is great stuff." And, and then I was off to the races. Um, I should point out, too, that I never really got into what we could call middle period Derrida. And so I'm changing the, t the, the subject a little bit. Um, this is from Derrida's, you know, early, really groundbreaking work um, in, in his career. And um, it, it's really, you know, it's great stuff. Uh, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, points that are contestable, but there's a lot of stuff that's really quite, you know, worth looking at again and, and learning from. Um, I would say that holds for speech and phenomena, for writing indifference. Uh, and then, you know, much, much later, we get this turn that happens with you know books like uh, the Gift of Death and the Specters of Marx and all that you know turn towards religion and, and politics in a very explicit way towards the end of Derrida's life and I like that stuff too although sometimes it's a little bit too precious right but the middle period uh, where Derrida has you know turned deconstruction into essentially his his approach to everything and it's a cottage industry and uh, he had lots and lots of acolytes. Uh, and he could pretty much do whatever he wanted in the way of deconstruction and people would buy it. Um, I didn't really get into it too much. I'd read it and I'd be like, I don't think this is a valuable reading of Plato or of Hegel. Um, I, I, get, I see what he's doing, 
But uh, I don't think I want to spend my time on this. So for me, it's always been, you know, the early period stuff I really like. Uh, the later period stuff, I, I respect. The middle period stuff, uh, you know, I leave that to the Derridians who are invested in, uh, you know, making sure that the master uh, has, you know, has his pedestal to be on. I, I, I'm not that, that sort of person. So, um, you know, for, for several years, I was uh, using Derrida quite a lot, although, um, you know, I, I would never say that I was a purist in the sense of thinking that Derrida had the answers to anything. You, you wouldn't be a good Derridian if you, if you did, quite, quite frankly. Um, and uh, I was also, you know, reading Deleuze and Foucault, you know, sort of the people that are contemporaries, um, still continuing and deepening my study of Nietzsche and Hegel um, and, um, you know, bringing in some other thinkers as well. I got into semiotics. Uh, I was reading a lot of Echo. We were fortunate as well that not only did we have a great uh, philosophy department, but the speech comm department also had another uh, great thinker, Richard Lanigan, who, who taught you know, several courses that I, I took on continental philosophy, but in terms of semiotics and communicology. So that was really uh, quite enjoyable. Now, what ended, you know, how did I sort of shift out of the Derridian phase? Um, I would say that there were a number of different things that brought me out of it. At, at bottom, um, I would say that the most important thing was discovering other authors who I thought were more valuable, you know, uh, who, who I enjoyed and got more out of reading and I, I thought were, you know, fundamentally more correct about, about matters. Um, one of those who played a very important role for me was, was uh, the 19th and 20th century philosopher Maurice Blondel, uh, sometimes called the Catholic Hegel or the French Hegel. Um, he used a, a method uh, which he calls early on the method of imminence, and then he kind of changes the name a little bit because it runs into some problems with imminentism, you know, in Catholic circles. Um, but it's, it's very similar to that of <clears throat> not only phenomenology, but also deconstruction. So he was doing something effectively like Derridian deconstruction, not quite so much focused on language per se, but on, you know, structures and how they fit into each other and what their presuppositions are and how they, you know, they, they're, you know, uh, working themselves out in, in, in action. Um, <clears throat> he was doing that sort of stuff back in 1893. Uh, I, I think Henri Bergson arguably was doing something similar. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll use sort of a joking thing as, as a, a, a sort of proof of this. I was in a... Um, summer uh, seminar uh, with, with my mentor, Garth, Garth Gillen. And I remember sitting in his office, we, we'd chosen to work on Bergson. And I was working on the essay on the immediate givens of the, the consciousness, what I think the fr English translation is time and free will, but the French is actually the essay on the immediate data or givens of, of consciousness. And what Berg, Bergson is doing there is, uh, again, somewhat similar to what Husserl was doing in phenomenology. Um, and he, you know, you can push his, his ideas about language in a certain way so you can get some fairly Derridian stuff out of it. And uh, my mentor actually kicked me out of his office and said, I don't want to hear regurgitated Derrida out of you. Come back when you have something uh, different to say about Bergson. Um, and so, you know, there, there was all of that. Um, I, would, I would say that another thing that was going on for me was I was getting deeper and deeper and deeper into the study of, of language and languages. Um, you know, I, I took Ferdinand de Saussure's uh, advice to heart. If you want to study linguistics, you need to master multiple languages. Otherwise, you're just theorizing about stuff that you don't understand very well. And so, so I did that. And the more that I, I did come to understand, you know, um, Indo-European comparative linguistics and, and how things were working in Greek and, you know, what was going on in, you know, this transformation in German and, and what the sense of different French words could be pushed to or all that, the less um, 
the less happy I was with some of Derrida's own <laughs> conclusions about things. Uh, and this is a problem also with, with other thinkers as well who like to really play with the language a lot. Um, but, but with Derrida, it's, it's, it's almost like an obsession with him. You can't, you know, he's, he's always got to push the envelope one thing further. And he's, he's the guy at the party who you'd be like, you know, buddy, that was really cool what you were doing uh, up until three minutes ago. And then you crossed a line and now it's just buffoonery or, you know, uh, it, you're, you're, being, you're being a pain. And we'd like to continue our conversation over here about what, what we're doing without your input anymore. Um, and, and so there was, you know, there's a kind of um, conflict and, and sadness that comes with that when you have an author who you particularly like, and then, you know, you, you come to conclusions different from them <clears throat> on good bases. So there was that. I, I also, you know, um, one of the other things that I, I think I really attracted me to Derrida was this this whole notion that, and you see this running through what we can call genealogical uh, approaches to philosophy in general, going all the way back beyond Nietzsche, um, but but you know you know that that whole thread is that we're going to sort of like un unmask things, we're going to pull the veil back, and why are we doing that? We're not doing it just to like say, well, everything is power and everybody's a hypocrite, and you know. Uh, Blah, 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 blah. You know, we can substitute whatever locutions you want in there, and people do all the time. Um, but it was, it was rather that there was something going on that could give way to a positive project. Um, underlying <clears throat> any sort of real critique that you know, the sort that you find, for example, in on grammatology is a, a yearning this is very clear in Derrida's later works, a yearning for something greater, something more positive. Let's call it freedom, or let's call it, you know, friendship, or whatever you want to, to call it. Um, and the idea is that, that, you know, modern reason and its political structures and the ways in which even codes and language work have choked that down, have, have suppressed that. There's, there's something that uh, is, is, is there for us as a possibility, <clears throat> but it's not often realized. And here's the thing that happened with me. I started, you know, uh, poking around, uh, you know, in, in my own existence and finding all sorts of pockets of things that looked like what, you know, we were supposed to be looking for and, and fighting for. Uh, and they didn't have to do with Derrida or his critique. Um, I, you know, I found that in, in significant part in um, intellectual communities that were being enriched by, um, you know, by, by religion, um, by, um, you know, various sorts of practices. Later on, I would say I, I find something similar in um, Aristotle and, and those who, you know, keep thinking through his work and in, in Stoicism. And in any case... Um, things are not as, as dim as Derrida presented them. Um, and I think this is, you can say the same thing about Deleuze and Foucault and, and a lot of these other people as well. Um, they, they're, they're too given to discounting uh, too much. So they're, like Leibniz says, they're, they're right in what they assert. They're wrong in what they deny. Um, great phrase. By the way, who did I learn that from? Not from reading the Leibniz, although I like Leibniz, but I skipped over that. Learned it from Blondell. Um, so, you know, I have not myself been doing an awful lot of work or even, you know, quite frankly, reading of Derrida for a long time. Um, I've only published two pieces that um, are connected with Derrida. One was very early on uh, in, in a journal called Minerva. Um, and that had to focus that that focused on his his later works. Uh, I'll put a link to it in, in the thing. Another made its way into this uh, book, Rethinking Philosophy of Religion. It's one of the book chapters. Um, it's been years since I've actually read it. Uh, it's called Continental Philosophy, Catholicism, and the Exigencies, Exigencies of Responsibility, the Resources of Maurice Blondel's works. But it's actually a piece that's about half halfway about Blondel and halfway about Derrida, essentially saying, 
hey, hey, Deridians, because there were a lot of Deridians at this conference, all that stuff you really love about Derrida, uh, you can find that in Blondell. And he did that in part because of his uh, grounding in, in, you know, a Catholic community and intellectual tradition. So things are not quite so bad as uh, you Deridians who now want to recuperate religion as a resource uh, have, have presented things. So uh, since then, I haven't really done an awful lot. I've, I've you know, prescribed um, Derrida as readings in, in classes when I had the opportunity to teach continental philosophy classes, which is a long time ago now that I think about it. Um, the last time that I assigned Derrida in a class would have been when I was still teaching in the prison. So, you know, at the latest 2008, but probably earlier than that. Um, I still enjoy reading him and, uh, you know, down the line, I, I want to go back through, uh, the grammatology and a few other works very closely. I might even put together a course on it. I don't know. It, it, we'll, we'll have to see whether it's, it, it merits my time or not. Um, but I, I've, had, I've long had this, this, this desire to write a book uh, essentially about 20th century continental philosophy, although I might you know, sneak in some other people who are more recent as well, saying, um, here, here I'm revealing my own sort of you know, uh, where I stand, saying, um, well, um, what of this is still valuable or valid in, in the present upon retrospect? It was really cool to read it. It was so much fun in my 20s to, you know, to be the, the person who's doing all this, this cool stuff, reading these books and arguing these points. But frankly, a lot of that turned out to be um, not quite as, as solid as I thought um, or as well-founded as I thought and uh, what's still valuable in it. And I think there is still quite a bit that, that is valuable in, in Derrida's thought, particularly this you know, attentiveness to how um, you, can, you can always find you know, juncture points where something can be turned or twisted and whatever is pretending to be like the final answer or as he puts it, presence never in entirely provides that. Um, the notion that there's always some injustice concealed in the structures of justice that we put in place. I think that's quite valid. And his, his, his ways of trying to get at it, I think, make a, a good bit of sense. Now, of course, Plato said that back in his, his own time, or he had Socrates say it in his own dialogues, that any justice that we see in this world is never fully justice. You just have to turn it around a little bit and you'll, you'll, you'll find the injustice lurking within it. But, um, you know, sometimes these things have to be framed in contemporary ways. So, that's uh, a bit about my, my own uh, interest in Derrida and my time that I spent, you might say, apprenticing, uh, not directly under him, of course, but, but you know, reading and rereading and thinking through his, his works and engaging with others about that. And a bit about why uh, I don't, uh, you know, for a long time, I don't, you know, fit into that framework anymore, but what I still like about, about Derrida.